And to present on behalf of uh, Roger Helmer, our energy spokesman, can I please introduce our national agent, Paul Oakden. Good morning, conference. As you may have noticed, uh, if for no reason other than the lack of a handlebar moustache, I am not Roger Helmer. Uh, he sends his apologies, and I'm very privileged to have been asked to deliver for you today uh, his policy statement on energy. On Friday, February the 13th, the three old parties colluded to reinforce their failing climate policies. We've always said that the old parties don't offer a genuine choice to voters, and this blatant co uh, collusion proves it. Now, only UKIP offers a rational alternative for secure and affordable energy for households and for British industry. Their plans are based on the 2008 Climate Change Act, which is estimated to cost an eye-watering £18 billion a year for 40 years. That's a gut-wrenching £720 billion over the period, a £28,000 bill for every household in our country. The Climate Change Act 2008 will cost every household in Britain £28,000 over 40 years. Yet this policy will fail in its own terms. It will not reduce global emissions, but it will do untold economic damage. Now, with all those wind farms they're building, you may wonder just why their policy won't reduce emissions. Firstly, renewables are intermittent, so they require intermittent fossil fuel backup. But running the backup intermittently is inefficient and substantially offsets the savings from renewables. Secondly, while we focus on green gesture politics, other countries adopt a more rational approach. There are 1,200 new coal-fired power plants in the global pipeline. Global emissions will increase whatever we do. Thirdly, energy intensive industries are moving offshore, taking their jobs and their investment and their emissions with them. And fourth, if we achieve any reduction in fossil fuel use in Europe, it will simply create more elbow room and lower prices in global energy markets, leading to more consumption elsewhere. As Roger has often said, these policies are utterly ineffectual and they are undermining our economy. But we don't have to take Roger's word for it. Former Energy Commissioner Gunter Ertiger has said, Europe can no longer afford to adopt a unilateral climate policy. And there's little sign of the rest of the world coming on board. And former industry commissioner Antonio Tajani, now a prominent MEP in the industry committee, has said, we are creating an industrial massacre in Europe with energy prices. Strong language for a European commissioner. In fact, leaving aside Japan, which as an island nation with no indigenous energy resources is a special case, we find that energy prices in the EU are now double those of our major competitors. So how has this come about? The EU has set aggressive targets for emissions reductions, which have meant grace over investment in intermittent and expensive renewables. The EU has forced the closure of low-cost coal-fired power stations. It's created a cat's cradle of subsidies, incentives, renewables obligations, quasi-carbon taxes like the Emissions Trading Scheme or ETS, capacity payments to spinning reserve, and so on. And it has resolutely set itself against low-cost alternatives like coal and indigenous gas. Let's be clear, this is no accident of fate or freak of nature. This is deliberate policy. And when Roger challenged the new EU Energy Commissioner, Miguel Arias Kenyatta, on this issue, his solution was simply a more integrated European energy market. As Roger put it at the time, that's fiddling at the margin and ignoring the real issues. Roger has repeatedly insisted that energy pricing in the EU is driving industries, jobs and investment offshore, often to jurisdictions with lower environmental standards, thus potentially increasing emissions, while we undermine European economies. And let's look at some examples. Take aluminium. Since 2007, the European aluminium smelting industry has closed 36% of its capacity. That's 11 smelters out of 24. It's lost around 20, 42,000 jobs, many of them high-value jobs in R&D. 
And this is not because of a lack of demand, which has been rising. Imports have been rising rapidly and now amount to over 50% of European consumption. We've been exporting production and jobs and emissions. So what does this mean for Britain? In 2009, the Anglesey aluminium plant closed down with a loss of 400 jobs. A further 80 residual jobs went in 2013. In Northumberland, the Elk and Lymouth plant closed in 2012 with a loss of 515 jobs. The power plant that supplied it was ruled to be in breach of the EU's large combustion plant directive. But it's not just aluminium. The steel industry is facing very similar problems. Between 2007 and 2014, EU production fell by 20%, despite increased consumption. An eye-watering 80,000 jobs were lost. And industry insiders tell us that a tonne of steel made in Shanghai involves double the emissions of the same tonne of steel made in Sheffield. Again, we're exporting jobs and emissions. Chemicals face the same problem. 22 chemicals plants have closed in the UK since 2009. Jim Ratcliffe, chief executive of INEOS, says that the European chemical industry in Europe could be extinct in 10 years unless we address the problem. Petroleum refinery, uh, refining is also facing problems. It's now cheaper to import refined petrol from the USA or Russia than to refine it here in Europe. 17 refineries in Europe have shut down in the last seven years, including three in the UK, a 10% capacity decline. 10,000 direct and 40,000 indirect jobs have been lost. In 2009, Petroplus closed Teesside and Corriton in 2012. Merco closed Milford Haven in 2014. Research commissioned and published by the British government shows that overseas refineries typically emit 35% more CO2 per unit than UK refineries. There's a similar story to telling glass and cement. Industries uh, in the glass industry, fact, uh, factories are closing in Europe only to be replaced by plants nearby in Russia and in Turkey and in Egypt. Much of our coal-fired generation capacity is being lost as a direct result of the EU's large combustion plant directive. Perfectly good coal-fired power stations like Kings North here in Kent are closing. Of course we could be building new coal generation capacity as Germany is doing. They have a couple of dozen new coal plants in the pipeline but our government is running scared of the Green Lobby and a few dozen demonstrators. These people hate prosperity, hate growth, and hate industry. Big Green has been spreading black propaganda about both nuclear and gas, shale gas, yet ironically, nuclear and shale gas are arguably two of the safest and cleanest technologies which are available. In the case of gas, many commentators also believe that the Russians are quietly backing anti-shale campaigns desperate to protect Gazprom and Russian gas, Russian gas exports. These green campaigners, those few, they like to present themselves as friends of the earth, but they're damaging our economy and undermining British employment. And there is a fine line between being a friend of the earth and being an enemy of the people. The EU sets fanciful targets for increasing manufacturing in Europe, but its policies are driving deindustrialization on a grand scale. Typical of the EU's failed policies is the Emissions Trading Scheme, or ETS. It was designed as a market mechanism to allocate carbon emission rights efficiently and to send price signals to the market to promote energy efficiency and investment in low carbon technologies. But it's become a dog's breakfast. Despite the huge administrative burden and cost of operating an emissions trading scheme, the emissions price remained too low to deliver any kind of incentive. So despite the energy prices, the EU is devising sticking plaster solutions to drive up energy prices further. And this is madness writ large. The ETS doesn't need any more sticking plaster solutions. It needs radical surgery, or even better, euthanasia.
it is time that it was put out of its misery. The threat is not merely to pricing and competitiveness. There is also a threat to security of supply. In the UK, our reserve generating capacity is down to an alarming 4%. Three years ago, it stood at a comfortable 17%. But never mind, says the national grid, because we have a cunning plan with two elements. Firstly, a contractual deal under which large energy users agree to reduce demand in challenging conditions. And second, deals with organisations which own large diesel generators to make these available to the grid in the case of need. Conference, you couldn't make it up. In order to save the planet and cut CO2 emissions, our fallback position is diesel generators. So how did we get into this mess? It's time to name and to shame the guilty men. And of course, it starts, as you would expect, in, the Euro in, uh, in Brussels with the Climate and Energy Package. Originally proposed by the Commission in January 2017, in seven, it involved swinging reductions in CO2 emissions, down 20% by 2020 compared to 1990 levels. They also aspire to a reduction of 40% by 2030 and have set a target of 80% by 2050, which is only 35 years away and would involve the almost total deindustrialization of Europe. We can look forward to a brave new world where every man has an acre and a cow. <laughs> With the exception, of course, is that cows will be banned because of their methane emissions. But as is traditional in these matters, we in Britain took the EU plan and we gold-plated it. With indecent haste, the House of Commons passed the Climate Change Act in October 2008, perhaps the most expensive peacetime bill ever adopted by Westminster. There was no thought about affordability or competitiveness, no credible impact assessment, no debate on the fundamental question of whether the targets were justified, no discussion of adaptation, as an alternative to mitigation. And the man responsible for the act is now a familiar household name, if only for his inability to eat a ham sandwich. <laughs> None other than our friend Ed Miliband, who in 2008 was the Secretary of State for Energy and Climate and steered the bill through the Commons. We are simply unable to think of anybody else in history who has done so much damage to our country in one single act. The act purports to make it a legal requirement to achieve the 80% CO2 reduction target by 2050. And one has to wonder quite who will be sent to jail when the target is breached, although we in this hall may have some suggestions. Miliband's culpability doesn't end with the Climate Change Act, egregious as that was. He, was recently he has recently proposed an energy price freeze, and this has had several perverse effects. First, it persuaded energy companies to hold energy prices higher than they need be, so that any freeze following the election would start at a higher base. Second, energy prices are now falling, so a freeze would have had the effect of maintaining prices higher than they need be. But third and most serious, the investment climate for the new energy infrastructure, which we need so desperately, is already very difficult. Government price controls would make it virtually impossible. And if we're left in any doubt over Miliband's questionable record on climate change, we need only look at his recent appointment of John Prescott as his climate change guru. <laughs> We must all now assume, conference, that two Jags will be swapping to a chauffeur-driven Prius <laughs> as Labour build up to their election campaign. <laughs> Our second guilty man is Mr Chris Hewn, synonymous with the word guilty. Um, <laughs> 
for having famously persuaded his then wife to take his, uh, his speeding rap. He's been an MEP, uh, was an MEP from 1999 to 2005, uh, which should have flagged some warning bells for us. And Secretary of State for Energy and Climate Change from 2010 to 2012. Another obsessive greening. And then we come to Mr. Ed Davey. If anything more obsessed with climate alarm alarmism than Hume. Here's a headline quote from Ed. Onshore wind farms are essential to keep energy bills down and the country needs more of them. In Alice in Wonderland, the White Queen reckoned she could believe six impossible things before breakfast. Sadly, Ed Davey believes a whole lot of impossible things all of the time. No, Ed, it's the exact opposite. Wind turbines are driving up energy costs and we need fewer of them. Then there's Tim Yeo of the Climate Change Committee, another obsessive greenie. And our rogues gallery wouldn't be complete without George Osborne and his deliberate attempt to undermine the competitiveness of British industry with his carbon price floor. Although I suspect he has been motivated more by tax revenues than by doctrinaire environmentalism. That's a hard one to say. <laughs> one caveat, we expect that solar will it become competitive or as the industry puts it, achieve grid parity in the next few years. Although right now it's like chasing a moving target. Now we don't like to raise problems unless we can also propose solutions. And here are the solutions are simple and common sense. We need to abandon hopelessly expensive renewables. We need to exploit low-cost energy resources like coal and indigenous gas. And we need to provide a reliable and consistent regulatory environment to facilitate investment in all affordable energy technologies, including nuclear. <laughs> Conference, our party goes into the general election in May believing in Britain. And now we are asking the people of Britain to believe in our party. If they do that, they can go into this election with confidence of knowing that our message on energy is simple. We're the only party promising secure and affordable energy to households and to British industry, and we know how to deliver. Thank you.